Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this Teradatu guest talk from Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. It's great to see so many familiar faces and also great to see so many of you that I don't recognize. Welcome to anyone joining us from outside of the Terra.do community. My name is Greg Findlay. I am director of Terra.do's 12-week flagship course, Climate Change Learning for Action. And we still have a lot of folks coming in, but I'm gonna go ahead and continue. Um, this talk today is the keynote for the fellows in our newly launched YAKS cohort of Learning for Action. And it is also one of the expert guest talks for the fellows in our ongoing Xeris cohort. These two cohorts together are made up of more than 350 fellows from more than 30 countries, and they come from a broad range of professional backgrounds. They are entrepreneurs, software engineers, project managers, transitioning oil and gas sector workers, journalists, bankers, farmers, activists, and scientists, and all looking to apply their skills to solving climate change. The Learning for Action course is an intensive exploration of climate science, climate impacts, and climate solutions. And it is a combination of written classes, live weekly lab sessions, deep dives, and expert guest talks and workshops. Teradadu was founded in 2020, and we have an ambitious goal of getting 100 million people working on climate change this decade. You can check out our programs at Terra.do on the web, and you can download our app, which is available on the Apple App Store and Google Play. We offer a new cohort of Learning for Action starting every six weeks, and we urge you to check it out if you want to learn more about how you can become involved in addressing climate change. Our next cohort begins March 20th. Before we get started, I do want to go over a few points about this Zoom session. Please keep yourself on mute during the talk so we can all hear what Dr. Heho has to say. And then following the talk, we'll have some time for questions and answers. But we are prioritizing questions from our current fellows using Slido, an online question and answer platform. And Zira's or, and Yak and Zebra fellows, you have a link to that, which was shared on Slack. So now I'm honored to introduce Dr. Catherine Hayho today. Dr. Hayho almost doesn't need an introduction. She is a highly accomplished atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding the impacts of climate change on people and the planet. Her areas of expertise include science communication, greenhouse gas emissions, and developing and applying high resolution climate projections for assessing regional to local scale impacts of climate change on human systems and the natural environment. She has received numerous awards and recognitions for her work, including four honorary doctorates and being named a United Nations Champion of the Earth. She's the Chief Scientist for the Nature Conservancy, and she is the Horn Distinguished Professor and Endowed Professor of Public Policy and Public Law at Texas Tech University. She has also served as a lead author for the second, third, and fourth U.S. National Climate Assessments, and her work has resulted in over 125 peer-reviewed papers, abstracts, and other publications. Dr. Hayhoe also hosts the PBS digital series, Global Weirding, and is a co-founder of Science Moms. Her incredible book, Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World, was published in 2021. If you haven't read it yet, do yourself a favor and go buy a copy today. It's a fantastic read. It's very clear and easy to understand. And best of all, it's full of hope. Dr. Heho has won numerous awards and accolades, and she has been named to lists such as the Time 100 Most Influential People, Fortune 50 World's Greatest Leaders, Foreign Policies 100 Global Thinkers, and Working Mothers 50 Influential Moms. If I were to list all of her honors, awards, and publications, we wouldn't have time to hear from Dr. Heho herself, so I'm going to stop there. But I do want to say she is best known, at least to non-scientist climate people like myself, for helping us find connections with people in our communities and families so that we can have civil and productive discussions about climate change. Before I had heard of Dr. Heho many, many years ago, I learned the hard way that hitting people over the head with fact after fact didn't change anybody's mind and it didn't lead to productive discussions. Neither did raising my voice or getting angry. Rather than encouraging people to discuss climate with me, I became that guy that everyone moved away from at parties. 
trust me, you don't want to be that guy. It doesn't get you anywhere when you end up talking to yourself an awful lot at parties. So thank you, Dr. Heho, for helping me and so many millions of people realize that there is a better way to break down barriers to public acceptance of climate change and that it is possible to connect with people based on a foundation of shared values and concerns to productively discuss climate change. I can happily report that thanks to Dr. Heho, people no longer run away from me at parties, and I've had deep and productive conversations about climate with all sorts of people. Dr. Heho is one of my personal climate heroes, and I'm honored that she's here to share her advice and thoughts with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Heho, and I'll pass to you. I think you're on mute, Catherine. I am. There we go. Thank you for that introduction, Greg. And I, I, I love that. So this is this is a talk about how not to be that guy, <laughs> so, which is the perfect way to begin the cohort. And I'm so glad that you're recording this because I'm a big fan of recycling. And by recycling, I don't just mean the objects that we have, but I mean recycling information as well. And so in this day and age, having recordings to watch is really, really important. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about today. We are gonna to be taking some questions afterwards, um, but hopefully I can answer a lot of your questions. And my goal is to provide a frame moving into this cohort, this training session that you can use. Well, my gosh, that was like huge lightning and thunder right outside. You probably saw it flash over my face. Um, my goal is to provide a frame for you um, to filter and interpret and apply the information that you are going to be getting over the next couple of weeks through. So where I want to begin is I want to begin with where we are. Um, because we can't just immediately begin with, with um, you know, where we're going to go if we don't understand where we currently stand. And I'm a scientist, and to be very blunt, where we currently stand is bad. So let me start by sharing my slides with you. Um, when we look back in the history of the planet, which we climate scientists do, we look back thousands and millions of years in the past, we know that we have never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. As far back as we can go in the history of the Earth, the time when it was warming the fastest was about 55 million years ago. And at that time, there was only about a tenth of the carbon going into the atmosphere naturally as we humans are digging up and putting in the atmosphere today. So this is truly an unprecedented experiment. Why does it matter? It matters because this is our home. This is the only home that we have. And here on this earth, we humans have been here for, you know, a matter of seconds compared to the, the life of the earth. And we have built a civilization over the last six to 8,000 years, which is almost entirely based on what? On looking to the past as a guide for the future. Our entire civilization, how we allocate our water, our building codes and standards, where our cities are located, how, where, and when we grow our crops, even our geopolitical boundaries, uh, many of them are predicated on conditions of the past. So it's as if we've been planning for the future, driving down the road, looking in the rearview mirror. And you might say, well, that sounds ridiculous, but there are circumstances under which that works okay. Not great if there's any obstacles up ahead, but there are circumstances under which you could stay on the road if you're looking in the rearview mirror. What are those circumstances? If the road is really dead straight, if you're driving down a dead straight road and there's no variability, then you can stay on the road looking in the rearview mirror. And this is what we humans have been doing for the last few thousand years. Now, there have been a few civilizations like the Mayan civilization that was subject to massive drought in part because they cut down all the trees surrounding their cities. There are individual civilizations that have fallen prey to large climatic variations in their region. But overall, human civilization has survived because over the history of our civilization on this planet, the average temperature of the planet has been as stable as that of the human body. So your human body temperature goes up and down by a few tenths of a degree over the course of a day, and that's normal. The average temperature of the planet has gone up and down by a few tenths of a degree over human civilization, and that's normal. But we know that there's been much larger swings in the past, and we know that we're heading into a much larger human-caused change right now. And so a more accurate picture of where we're at is this. We are on a massive curve, the likes of which we humans have never seen before, and we are all piled into this collective bus together, and the bus's wheels are on the rumble strip already. 
So that's the situation that we find ourselves in. Because today we know that climate is changing faster than any time that we humans have seen. And that's why this matters. It's because we are not prepared for this. And this warming is so fast. It's about 50 times faster than between the last ice age and today that a lot of the species that share our home can't keep up with it either. It isn't just about us. Now, how is this warming manifesting itself? How do we see it day to day? How do we observe it? We don't observe global warming. We'd have to be able to add up all the thermometer temperatures around the whole world every day and then add them up for 20 years and fit a line through them to, you know, to see what was happening to the planet. But we can see the impacts with our eyes from day to day. And how do we see those impacts? We see them in the way that climate change is supersizing our weather and climate disasters. This is a map of the billion dollar weather and climate disasters that have happened across the US since 1980. I live in Texas, which is number one, Louisiana and Florida are right up there with Texas. California is right after that. And when NOAA started tracking these, and by NOAA, I mean the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, not anybody called NOAA. When NOAA started tracking these in 1980s, there were on average one of these events every four years, sorry, months, one event every four months. Now there's one event every 2.8 weeks. So that's how this has changed. And the way I think of it is this, wherever you live, it's as if you have a pair of dice and we always have a chance of rolling a double six. So, you know, if you live out West, there's a chance of a, a wildfire. If you live on the Gulf Coast, there's a chance of a hurricane. If you live in the Northeast, there's a chance of a Nor'easter winter storm or a flood. Um, you know, if you live in the Midwest, there's a chance of a heat wave or a drought. So wherever you live, there's always chances of rolling a double six naturally. That's normal. But as the world gets warmer, decade by decade, it's as if it's sneaking in and taking one of these numbers and turning them into a six, taking another number and turning it into a six, and then even taking some numbers and turning them into sevens. And then all of a sudden you're like, hey, we just had three 500 year flood events in three years. How could that be happening? Climate change loading the weather dice against us. It's making our droughts more intense. It's making our heat waves more frequent and more dangerous. It's causing wildfires to burn greater area because hotter and drier conditions, once that fire starts, and most of them are the result of accidental human ignition, once that fire starts, there's all of this fuel for the fire. And it's causing our hurricanes to intensify faster and to dump a lot more rain on us. So when we look at the headlines, these are the types of headlines we see. Glaciers are melting faster, sea levels rising faster, the costs of climate change are underestimated, it's happening faster than we thought because we scientists, we are conservative, small c conservative. We always try to go for the lower rather than the higher and we're seeing that these changes are a lot bigger than we thought because we've never seen anything like this before in human history. And the evidence is all around us, whether again, it's heat waves, wildfires, flooding. As the prime minister of Dominica said several years ago when his entire island was just devastated by a hurricane, he said to deny climate change is to deny the truth that we have just lived. So when we see all of this, and this is where we are, and you know these headlines, you've seen them too. We understand that this matters because it affects the water that we drink and we all need water. It affects the air that we breathe, not only through climate change, but just through burning fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels is responsible for 10 million premature deaths a year because of the air pollution it causes. 10 million a year, that's double the number of COVID deaths a year from air pollution. It affects the food that we eat. It affects the buildings and roads and systems we use, all of which were built for a planet that no longer exists. It affects the nature that surrounds us and on which our life depends. When you look at what climate change affects, I can't think of anything it doesn't affect. It affects our infrastructure and our economy and our energy. So if you work in infrastructure or economics or business or the energy sector, climate change affects your work. It affects our water, our natural resources and our health. If you work in any of those sectors, climate change is affecting you. It affects our food, it affects biodiversity, it even affects geopolitical conflict just talk to climate scientists in Ukraine and you will know, they will tell you exactly how fossil fuels are involved in motivating the war on Ukraine. 
and it is an issue of justice and equity. So anyone who works with marginalized or vulnerable communities knows that climate change is a threat multiplier. You can see the lightning, probably hear the thunder behind me. <laughs> so it really honestly is not about saving the planet. And in fact, when people say it's about saving the planet, I cringe. Why? It's because the planet doesn't need us. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. Who's most at risk? We are most at risk and most of the living things that share this planet with us. Not the possums, not the cockroaches, but everything else plus us, we are the ones at risk. And so that's why when I wrote that book that Greg referred to, I didn't call it saving the planet, I called it saving us because it really is about us. And that's a huge paradigm shift because when people talk about saving the planet, let me tell you, it sets up a conflict in people's minds between people or the planet, the environment or the economy. But the reality is the economy can't survive without the environment. Where does all the resources come from that powers the economy? People can't survive without the planet. This is our home. So it isn't one or the other. It's either all of us living things who share this planet or it's nothing. And it's really important when we talk about climate change to make sure that we show people that who they are is the perfect person to care because their interests are already fully aligned with saving us. It might sound like a nuance, but it's really, really important. So then we say, all right, if people just knew the facts, though, surely they changed their minds, right? So all we have to do is tell them the facts. Like Greg said, you turn into that guy at the party. You're like, I have the facts. Well, believe me, we do have the facts. So let me just give you a couple of examples of those facts that we have. If you go to Google Scholar, which is there where scientific papers are archived, there are over two and a half million scientific studies. It's a lot of facts. The IPCC has published dozens of reports, including the climate change reports that come out every seven or eight years. The National Climate Assessment, one, two, three, and then I was the lead author for two, three, and four, and then I'm working on five right now. Those are full of the facts too. And a couple of years ago, together with some colleagues, we took the 38 studies that have been published in the last 10 years, whose results oppose the conclusions that climate is changing or humans are responsible. Now, on the other side, there was literally over a million studies <laughs> that show that it is changing and or humans are responsible and or the impacts are serious. But we wanted to know, do those 38 studies that were published saying it isn't serious or it's not real, or it's not humans, did they have a leg to stand on? And what we found is after recalculating each of them from scratch, you know how much work that was, <laughs> 38 papers recalculated from scratch, we found an error in every single one of them, at least one error, that if you corrected it, brought them right in line with the scientific consensus. So believe me, we have the facts. And not only do we have the facts, but we have been communicating the facts. A couple of years ago, there was the World Scientist Warning of a Climate Emergency that was signed by 11,000 scientists. It's a lot of scientists. And it said, we have a moral obligation to warn humanity and to tell it like it is. We do. So we have. We are not the first people to do it. The scientists who have studied climate change over the years from Joseph Fourier in the 1820s to Eunice Foote in the 1850s to Guy Callender in the 1930s. And then we've got John Tyndall and Svante Arrhenius in there. Arrhenius, of course, being a Swedish chemist who is a distant cousin of Greta Thunberg's. It runs in the family. They have been communicating the dangers of increasing CO2 in the atmosphere for over 100 years. And then today, climate scientists are doing anything they can. There's climate scientists marching, there's climate scientists on social media, and I have a list of now three point uh, three and a half thousand um, climate scientists on Twitter alone. I'm part of Science Moms, as Greg mentioned, and, and we've got a group of moms who are scientists talking about why it matters. We've got scientists, you know, chaining themselves to banks. We are trying everything we can to get the news out but somehow we just aren't acting at speed. And that's because of something that is really shocking to those of us who feel like if I just tell people the information, they should change their minds. And here it is, and you might not believe me, but I'm gonna explain why this is the case. 
people don't really have a problem with the science that explains why climate is changing. Now, you might say, but Catherine, don't you hear all those people saying it's just a natural cycle or it's just volcanoes or it's just the sun? Oh, yes, I do hear those people. And in fact, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I heard from over a thousand of those people in the last three days. And because Twitter is turning to an absolute cesspool of trolling. And so the number one objection is it's just a natural cycle. And then there's all kinds of other sciencey objections like you scientists aren't sure. How do you know? Haven't you looked far back enough in the past? I know that most objections are sciencey sounding objections. But if you just scratch the surface, like you know those little things where you scratch it off to see what's underneath, and that the, what you're scratching is just paper thin, if you scratch the surface right underneath that science denial is solution aversion. The real problem is people don't want to fix it, but it doesn't sound so good to say it's a real problem, but I want to fix it. So instead they say it's not real. But here's the problem. If those sciencey sounding excuses are just excuses, then addressing the science sounding excuses isn't going to fix the problem. In fact, what's going to happen is the whack-a-mole game. Have you ever been at the fair? You've ever seen the whack-a-mole game? You whack one mole, what happens? The next one pops up. You whack that one, the next one pops up. And you can keep on going. In fact, there's over 200 common myths about climate change and you can go through just about every single one of them with somebody and it won't change their mind. Why not? Well, here's one reason because if they truly had a problem with the science, they wouldn't be using airplane stoves or fridges either because it's the same physics. And there aren't a lot of people who say that fridges don't work. Not a lot of conspiracy sites on the internet that say that fridges are a hoax. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that over the last 30 years, the United States has gotten more politically polarized than it's been in hundreds of years. Back in the 1990s, this was the landscape of politics in the US. Median Democrat, median Republican, closer to each other than to the opposite ends of the political spectrum. Then over time, what happened? 2011, 2017. And then if you only ask people who voted in 2017, this is what it looked like. The median Democrat was closer to the tail, the fringe, of their party than the median Republican, and the median Republican was closer to the fringe of their party. Now, everybody thinks it's the other party that did this. As you can see, it happened on both sides. And as a result, we are currently at a place where the United States is more politically polarized since any time since the Civil War. That's a dangerous situation to be in. What does this have to do with climate change? Well, it has a lot to do with climate change because as this analysis showed by a really interesting organization called the Beyond Conflict Institute who studied Northern Ireland in the 70s, they worked in South Africa in the 80s, and now guess where they're working? They're working in the United States now. They found that Americans who identify as either Democrat or Republican view each other less as fellow citizens and more as enemies who represent a profound threat to their identities. And when this mindset develops, compromise is viewed as weakness or betrayal. Now, again, what does this have to do with climate change? Well, let's take a look at the most politically polarized issues in the country. The gray bar shows the distance between Democrats and Republicans. And these issues are sorted in terms of the width of the gray bar. What issues at the top? climate change, and oops, and environmental protection. And this isn't new. It's been at the top at that point for over 10 years. And then you'll notice this 2020 COVID happened. What do you think happened during COVID? Well, by January 2021, dealing with the coronavirus outbreak had risen to one of the most politically polarized topics. De dealing with issues around race had risen to the very top of most politically polarized topics, but dealing with global climate change maintained its position right there at the top as well. So we are not dealing with a lack of facts. We are dealing with political polarization. And it is not, unfortunately, only in the United States. So across 56 countries around the world, education and experience in predicting whether people agree climate change was serious and we needed to do something about it, the influence of education experience was dwarfed by what? By ideology, worldview, and political orientation. 
the biggest correlation was with political affiliation. And then another study that looked at party um, polarization around the world found that when people who are more liberal are more educated on climate change, they tend to be more concerned about climate change. But in rich countries where we have large carbon footprints, so we feel guilty about our large carbon footprints, we often assuage our guilt through denial. Through basically saying, oh, it's not a big deal, or it's not me, or it's just a natural cycle, because we're guilty and we don't know what to do about it. And it's a defense mechanism. So addressing the, it's not us, it's just a natural cycle, it's no big deal, doesn't actually get to the root of the problem, because the root of the problem is not lack of science information, the root of the problem is we don't know what to do to fix it. This is Dan Cahan. I like to show you pictures of the people who do the research so you know who they are. Um, and he actually studied this. He said, we, we studied whether members of the public who were most science literate were most concerned about climate change. And he said, no, we found out they weren't. In fact, they were most polarized. Specifically, he asked people, is there solid evidence of recent global warming that, um, that is due to human activity like burning fossil fuels? And he developed this index called Ordinary Science Intelligence. And he found that there was a, a um, weak positive correlation between ordinary science intelligence and answering this question correctly. So going from you know about 35% uh, to about 60%. But then he took this group of people and he divided it in half. How do you think he divided it? He divided it by political affiliation. And this is what he found. He found that the, more, the smarter people were, the more divided they were. So people often say to me, oh, you know, if people don't accept climate change is real, they're just stupid or dumb or uneducated. No, we are likely to be smarter and more educated if we're more polarized on climate change. And so what he found is, and let me translate this into English. Here we go. Being smarter does not make us, any of us, us more accepting of science, it makes us better able to cherry pick what we need to validate what we already believe. And we all do this, all of us. In fact, in my book, Saving Us, I tell a story about myself and my husband. He has a PhD also, um, and our arguments over whether you can eat food that's past the due date. Um, so we have both found, gone out and found peer reviewed journal articles <laughs> that say whether you can or can't eat yogurt past the due date. So we are not, we're not trying to um, change our own minds. We are trying to convince the other person that we're right. And we all do this. So, and the smarter we are, the better we're able to argue. Now, Tally Sherratt is a neuroscientist and she explains why this is. She says our brains are programmed to get a kick out of information. That's the way our brains as humans work. But when we give people new information, they typically only accept it if they already believe it. If it contradicts what they believe, and really I should be saying our here too, if we, if it contradicts what we believe, our brains shut off all of our brains. So giving people new information that they don't believe is not going to cause their brains to change their minds, typically. There's always exceptions to the rule, but typically. So people don't really have a problem with lack of education or knowledge or intelligence, and they don't really have a problem with, you know, how much, how, you know, how much they know, because the smartest people are the most divided. So if you find someone who's really polarized on climate change, those people are probably really smart. So what's the problem? Now we're going to turn the corner here. We've talked about the problem with climate change. We've talked about the problem with assuming that more facts will change people's minds. Now we're turning the corner and we're going to talk about what, we, what the real problems are and what we can do to address them. The real problems are that we don't understand why it matters to us here. We, we, got, we have everything up here, but we haven't connected it to here. We don't understand why it matters to us here and now, and we don't know what we can do to fix it. And when we don't know what we can do to fix it, there's two reactions to that. If we don't know what we can do to fix it, we can either slide into what I've discussed before, denial. I don't know how to fix it, and I don't want to feel guilty and overwhelmed, so I'm just going to say it isn't a big deal, or it's not real. So denial is a response to not knowing what we can do to fix it. 
or the only solutions are all liberal solutions and I'm not liberal and I don't endorse those solutions. So we can't fix it. So if we can't fix it, it shouldn't be that big a deal because I'm not a bad person. And if I were, if I'm a good person, then if it was really a problem, I'd want to fix it. Now I'm sort of explaining the brain processes here, but they're not even conscious, they're subconscious. So we don't know how to fix it can slide into denial if people think the only solutions are liberal solutions that are inconsistent with who they are. But on the other side of the spectrum, I don't know what we can do to fix it can also slide into doomerism. If we're worried about climate change, but we don't know what's, what, what solutions we have, our defense mechanism, and this is again, a human defense mechanism, it's the way our brains are wired to work, is to say, oh, well, there's nothing we can do. I just give up, there's nothing we can do. And I run into these people on social media all the time. And I'm like, look, and I've even said this to a few people, if you're just here to tell people there's nothing we can do, well, you know what? Denialism and doomerism are gonna take us to the same result, which is disaster. So if you're just here to tell people there's nothing we can do, get off social media, go take a walk with your dog, spend time with the people you love doing the things you love, reminding yourself of why we have something to fight for. Because if you give up, you're just gonna give, lead us to the same place as someone who is denying the science. And so it isn't a continuum, it's a spectrum and you're wrapping right around to here. So there is no difference between people who accept the science but say we can't fix it and people who don't accept the science because they don't think we can fix it because the result, I mean, there's no difference in terms of the outcome. The outcome is the same. That's why we have to address these two issues. So how do we do it? Well, the first issue is the product of another way that our brain works, which is we are really good at psychological distance. I mean, we push off risks all the time. Like, do you really stand up and walk around every 30 seconds? Do you really eat everything you're supposed to and not eat anything you're not supposed to? Do you really do all the things that the doctors and the financial advisors recommend that we be doing? Most of us don't, why not? Not because we disbelieve them, but because we just think, oh, that's not gonna affect us until like the future. We push it off in time or we push it off in space. It happens to those people over there, but not here. Or it's, you know, abstract global average temperature rather than what's happening where I live. Or it's irrelevant to my concerns. It just matters to that type of person, but not to my type of person. I'm a business person. It doesn't matter to me. It just matters to people who work in nonprofits. We see this reflected in public opinion in the US. These are maps from the Yale program on climate communication. And what they're showing is public opinion by county. Where people say yes to the question above, it's um, orange and the darker orange it is, the more people say yes. If people say no, it's blue. And the darker blue it is, the more people say no. So is it happening? Most people say yes, it's happening. Is it going to harm plants and animals? Yes. Where is the psychological distance? Relevance, it's non-human species. Is it going to harm future generations? Yes, where's the distance? It's in the future, not now. Is it going to harm people who live in developing countries? Yes, mostly, we're getting a bit more blue here, but yes. Where's the distance? Over there, not here. And then they ask this question. Is it going to affect you? All of a sudden, yep, <laughs> just flips. Um, the only yellow places left are where there are people who demographically are most concerned about climate change. Now, which groups of people are most concerned about climate change? It turns out they are Hispanic, Catholics and Native Americans. Now you might say, well, of course, Hispanic Catholics the Pope, right? Yes, but it turns out, and this is just a, an aside, I could give a whole different talk on this topic alone, but just as an aside, do you know which group of people in the country is least concerned about climate change? You might have a guess, but I bet you don't know the right answer unless you know the survey results. The least concerned group of people by one percentage point over the second least concerned group is white Catholics. So you've got Hispanic Catholics on one side and white Catholics on the other, and then right there neck and neck with white Catholics are white evangelical Protestants. Also, they're one percentage point below white Catholics. Anyways, so that just shows you it's nothing to do with religion. It's everything to do with politics. So we have to talk, number one, in, about climate change in a way that makes it now, not in the future here, not over there, concrete, not abstract, and relevant to me. We also have to talk about what we can do to fix it. Because people want solutions, 
that give us something better, not something worse. And a lot of times solutions are couched in terms of loss. You can't do this. You can't eat this. You can't drive this. You can't have this. We humans are more averse to loss than we value gain. We will hang on to something rather than losing it, even if we're offered something slightly better. We want something way, way, way better to let go of what we're hanging on to. So often solutions are couched in exactly the way that causes humans to most resist them. Isn't that interesting? And that's where a lot of the solution aversion comes from that powers denial. As one person said to me, in the same breath, and actually I had quite a few people say this to me in the same breath in the same tweet on Twitter recently too, in the same breath, they will say, it is just the sun and the EPA wants to take away my wood burning stove. Or they will say, it's just a natural cycle and you want to destroy the economy. Or they will say, it's just volcanic emissions and you want to take away my truck. It's solution aversion that's driving the denial. So we have to talk about solutions that give us a better world, not a worse one. And then we also have to show people how they can make a difference because people on the doomerism side, so on the denial side, it's mostly, I don't like the solutions that people have told me about. There's literally memes going around about how Biden is going to take away your truck, your steak, and your child. But then on the other side, on the doomerism, it's mostly about lack of efficacy people don't think they can make a difference. And if we don't think that we can make a difference, why do anything, right? So we also have to show that there are things that we can do to make a difference ourselves. Those are the two ways that we need to address solutions. How do we tackle the psychological distance and build efficacy and address solution aversion? Well, it turns out that there's one simple step we often skip right over. It's so obvious and it's so simple that we just sort of skip right over it. And the data shows this. And now I left off here. Do you think it will harm us personally, right? And it was pretty blue. There's one darker map, blue map. Do you know what it is? Do you ever talk about it? Do you ever talk about it? And if you don't talk about it, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you ever do anything about it? So this is the simple step that we've been neglecting that kickstarts or catalyzes all this other action. And I'm not talking about time at the science. You now know that talking about the ice cores and the tree rings and the 2.5 million papers is not gonna cut it. We have to talk about the heart and the hands. We have to connect what's up here to what's in here, why it matters to us, to what's here, what we can do to fix it. So we care about climate change because it affects us, things we care about like our health, our food, security of our homes. I was in Iowa virtually a couple months ago and they asked me, okay, that's fine, but let's get down to it. How do I talk about polar bears? Just tell me how to talk about polar bears. And I said, you don't. We need to talk about what matters to people. So when I'm here in Texas, when I'm talking to Jack, I talk about cotton farming and Jack tells me, because a big part of it is asking people to tell them their, tell you their story, Jack tells me, that he hasn't seen a decent year of rain since 2005. When we're in California, we can talk about wildfires and my friends can tell me how they don't let their kids outside to play because of the terrible smoke they'd be breathing in. When we're in places that are experiencing massive floods, people who can tell, tell me about how their bridges have been washed away or their homes were flooded. When people live in big cities, they can tell me about how the air is so polluted. We can connect over things we share. I connect with people who love science like I do. I connect with people who live in Texas like I do. I connect with fellow Canadians like I am. I connect with people who love winter sports like I do. I connect with people who are parents like I am. I connect with people who share my faith. Whoever you are, you have ways to connect with people. As I talk about in my book, I've connected with people over a shared love of knitting or you know, beach vacations connect with something that we already care about and then connect the dots to how climate change is affecting it. Does this work? We have peer reviewed research showing it does. I'll put a link to the study in the chat after we're done, or maybe actually, Greg, you could just Google it and then put the link in there. It's on the Yale website. We made short one and a half minute videos talking about climate change from an issue that Republicans would connect with. 
free market, personal liberties, national security, Christian faith. And then the Yale researchers tracked whether it changed people's minds, and it did, and it changed Republican minds twice as much as Democrat minds. Why? Because we started with something that people cared about. And you can do that too. And if you don't know what people care about, how do you figure it out? You ask and you listen to what they say. So that's the first half. Now let's go to the second half. And then after this, we're gonna wrap it up and go to your questions. So how do we talk about what we can do to fix it? Well, I love talking about real solutions, like solutions that stop putting carbon into the atmosphere, that take carbon out of the atmosphere, that build resilience and help people prepare for the impacts of a changing climate. So we can talk about clean energy and we can talk about efficiency and how not only do they cut our carbon emissions, they save us money, they create jobs, they give us cleaner air. Who doesn't want that? We can talk about nature-based solutions like smart farming and conserving and protecting ecosystems that take carbon out of the atmosphere and filter our water and filter our air and give us shade and make it cooler and, oh, help with carbon too. I love talking about how countries are acting to make a difference. People are often surprised that countries are acting. I love talking about how corporations are acting and people are often surprised. They don't think corporations are acting. I like talking about how communities are acting, army bases, churches, community organizations, cities, farmers. I love talking about how young people are acting and they definitely are. I love talking about how my own life is changing and yours is too. How we get our energy, what I drive, what we eat. I love talking about how the world is changing. How solar energy is the cheapest form of energy we've ever had and is revolutionizing the lives of people in some of the poorest countries in the world. I love talking about climate solutions that can make a difference today through giving us cleaner air and water, protecting us from disasters, helping us grow more food, providing more affordable energy, reducing inequalities, making our cities safer and giving us a better and more stable world. Oh, and they help with climate change too. So how do we activate this? What's the secret sauce? The secret to catalyzing this, to unlocking all this potential is that simple step that we just skip right over. We don't talk about it. And when I talk to groups like you who are already fully informed and fully engaged, people say, well, everybody I know is already worried. So what's the point of talking about it? Or they don't care about it like I do. It doesn't matter to them in the same way it matters to me. And, or there's nothing we can do about it. So why talk about it? Well, here's the thing. We often assume that me and everybody on this call, we're worried, right? But everybody else I know, they don't wanna talk about it because they're not worried, we think. So then we're like, okay, so to make them worried, what do you have to do? You have to tell them all the scary facts. So we load up the scary facts about polar bears and Antarctica and sea level rise and we dump them on them. And what happens? Not what we wanted, why not? Because according to the polling data, that's not where people are at. According to the polling data, this is where we're at. There's a small group of people who claim not to be worried, but in my opinion, are mostly just reacting to solution aversion. They don't think there's any way they qu we can fix it. So they're just sort of pushing it all into a box and saying it's not real. Then most people are actually worried. But if you're worried and you don't know what to do about it, do you want to talk about it? No, I don't want to talk about things that I can't fix. So we don't talk about it, we self silence. And you know what? Only a tiny fraction of people are actually activated. So what is our goal? Is our goal to make people not worried worried? It'd be nice, but what's our primary goal? If we really wanna make the biggest difference, what's our goal? To make worried people activated. And how do you make worried people activated? Your conversation's very different than if you're trying to make not worried people worried, right? To make worried people activated, we have to talk about why it matters here and now and what we can do to fix it. So you might have seen this before, and if you haven't, you're going to see it probably over this course, right, Greg? <laughs> this is the six Americas of global warming that shows where people are on climate change. And typically when I say we need to talk about climate change, people go right to the purple on the far right. I'm going to convince Uncle Joe. I went to this webinar and it showed us how to talk about climate change. and I'm going to sock it to Uncle Joe. I'm going to be that guy. But I have some bad news for you. I don't think there's anything we can do to change a dismissive's mind. I honestly, sincerely believe it takes a miracle 
to change a dismissive's mind. And I think in about 15 years of doing this, I might have seen one or two miracles. I don't think I personally had anything to do with those miracles. But here's the good news. Dismissives are only 8% of the population. Most people are already concerned or cautious, but they just don't know what to do. A bunch of people are alarmed and they don't know what to do. Some people are doubtful. And we can talk a lot there about, you know, what matters to them. And that Yale experiment I referenced does get to the doubtful people. But most people are already over here. 70% are worried. 50% feel hopeless and don't know where to start. And only 8% are activated. How do we catalyze that activation? We catalyze it by showing people, and this is literally a scientific result from the IPCC, every action matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters. Every choice matters. Everything that you do matters. And how do we start that off? How, what knocks over the first domino? We knock over the first domino by just opening our mouths and having a conversation. As George Marshall says, who wrote a really great, great book called Don't Even Think About It, How Your Brain Is Wired to Ignore Climate Change. He says, talk is the fertile field in which cultural change begins. In its absence, it is impossible for a group of people to solve a problem. Conversations underpin all our action, where people choose to invest their money, what party they vote for, what energy source they use at home. How does all this begin with a conversation? Having conversations in our daily lives plays a huge role in creating contagious social change. We take our cues about what's important from what we hear with our family, our friends, our colleagues, and our neighbors, what they're talking about. And the goal of these conversations is not to tell people about it and overload them with facts. It is to bring them into the conversation by connecting again what? Our head to, our heart to, our hands. So here's the conclusion. When climate changes and you get worried, often you're tempted to just scare more, share more scary data. But people reject it even more if they don't know what to do about it and inaction results. Because as Tally Sherratt says, remember she's the neuroscientist we talked about earlier, fear and anxiety cause people in general, not just with climate change, to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. So what are you going to do? When climate changes and you get worried, here's what you're going to do. You're going to talk about why it affects us here and now in ways that are concrete and relevant and what are positive constructive solutions that we can engage in as a business, as an organization, as a group of people, as a neighborhood, as a family, as a school, as a church, as a group of people who walk their dogs together or play hockey together or kayak together. People feel empowered and that's when change results because as the neuroscience says, our brain is literally built to associate forward action with the reward, not avoiding harm. So reframe whatever you say and do so it produces hope, not dread. We're not gonna fix this without hope, but hope is based on action. And so that is the biggest thing that we have to instill in people is that sense of hope. So now that you know that, my only question left is, what are we waiting for? Let's do it. Wow. Thank you so much, Catherine. Amazing as always. And the comments in the chat are uh, people love your positivity, your smile, and of course, your incredible information. So thanks so much for being with us. Um, for those of you in our current cohorts, uh, the Yaks and the Zebras, please um, check out Slido, share your questions there, and you can also upvote others' questions. And um, I will start by sharing a couple of questions here. Um, They've moved around on me a little bit. So let me just take a look. How do you find uh, climate vulnerability for a person? Um, Gizm says, many people that I know um, feel that they're not vulnerable because they live in a developed country. Uh, anything that you might suggest on how to help approach those folks? Yes. So I'm going to put a couple of the resources um, that I mentioned in the chat. And one place to start with people is you could actually look up the state that you live in um, and you could find the billion dollar weather and climate disasters that have happened in that state. They're listed right here. And you could, you could ask them, were you here for that hurricane? Or were you here for that wildfire? Tell me your story. Like, what, what did you experience? And often when I'm talking with people in Texas, 
I tell stories about this in my book, Saving Us. I, I tell people, I ask them to share their weather stories with me instead of me telling them. And then I ask them, I say, do you feel like it's changed? And most people say, yeah, things are getting weirder. They're definitely changing. And then I say, then we can talk about, hey, that's happening in other places. But it isn't just about that. Often I ask people what they care about. So having conversations with them to learn about how they're passionate about fishing or they love their grandchildren or, you know, they're really into something and then connecting the dots. And there's this really cool um, app that Stanford students have developed that helps you find ways to connect climate change to things people are interested in. It is called Climate Mind, and I'm putting the link in here. It's called Climate Mind. And if people are interested in X, Climate Mind will give you like a couple of talking points on X that you can bring up with them and say, hey, did you know? Um, here's why it matters and here's what we can do to fix it. Awesome. So some people are saying great things in the chat. Um, some people are having a book discussion, which is great. Um, and connecting to local groups is really important. It's very important. Joining local organizations, um, and finding out what's happening locally and sharing that information. Um, awesome. Put, Thank you. Yes. So you've kind of addressed this, but, uh, and you just talked about it just now, but uh, a really popular question is, is there a playbook and effective scripts that help that exist to help us navigate these conversations? Basically, they want your transcripts and what do you say to folks? Um, there is. And um, first of all, a really great resource is Talking Climate right here. I'm just throwing links in here. So make sure you click on all those links and save them. Talking Climate has a really, really good sort of short pamphlet that takes you through the different steps. And then in my book, it's really interesting because I finished writing my book and then I got a number of people to be my beta readers. And, and one of my, my sister is an editor. So I got her to be a beta reader and she read it. And she said, you forgot to write a chapter. And I was like, what chapter? And she's like, you forgot to actually write like how to start the conversation, what to say, and then how to end it, and then what to do afterwards. And so I was like, oh my gosh, you're so right. So I literally wrote a chapter in my book that is, is, is maps that too. But um, the, um, the Talking Climate um, pamphlet or little booklet there is phenomenal. Awesome, thanks. Um, We've got some questions that say, do you have any thoughts on how to move beyond grassroots conversations and individual responsibility to get people to think about larger systems change issues? Yes. So here um, is a really great resource that I helped to curate for the movie Don't Look Up that talks about how to go from individual to system change. I'll just put that in the chat. And in a nutshell, people often say, do we need individual or systemic change? And my answer is, Yes, <laughs> because how does a system change? It's made up of people. And so the only way a system has ever changed that's made up of a social system is when somebody opened their mouth and said, hey, what about this? Or let's do this. Or have you ever considered this? Or we shouldn't be doing this. And then they gathered other people together and said, yeah, you're right. You know what? I agree with you. Or, you know, I'm not sure about that, but what about this? How does the system change? It changes when people engage with the system. And so in a nutshell, engaging with the system is the number one way that we as individuals can affect change. And what's the first step to engaging with the system? It is often to open our mouths. Not always though. Sometimes changing the system, we just have to do something that other people see. So for example, um, in my book, I talk about how um, solar panels are literally contagious. The number one predictor of whether somebody has solar panels on their roof is not whether they know someone who has them, but whether somebody within a mile of their house has them. So even just seeing it as a form of communication or, you know, seeing people do things. But um, when we engage with the system, that is how we affect change. And that Don't Look Up site offers six very concrete ideas on how we connect with the system. Yeah, I can personally attest to the fact that uh, when people see your solar panels, they want to do them. I put panels on my own home in rural Wyoming, a very conservative state. My next door neighbors saw them, came and asked me about them. They put them on. Then another neighbor asked and they put solar panels on. It is contagious. So thanks for that. I love that. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a question too that says what we eat, but I we could change that to what we drive, how we heat our homes, how we cook our food, whatever, are deeply personal. Uh, but we know that eating less meat is better. How do we convince people without making them feel like they're giving something up? Exactly. You know that there's two problems with solutions. One is that they have a sense of loss rather than gain. 
number one. And then the other solution is we don't feel like we personally can engage in that solution. We don't feel efficacy. So with personal solutions, um, what I do is every year, uh, at the beginning of the year, I take on two new solutions myself and continue the previous ones. And then I talk about them, I share them, and I emphasize the benefits of them. So um, it's really important to recognize that there's not one thing. Even I know you've heard if everybody goes vegan, that would fix climate change, it won't. But one of the climate solutions is definitely eating more plants, a lot more plants, and reducing food waste. Food waste is a huge problem. We waste 50% of the food we produce. So talking about, hey, I tried this phenomenal recipe, it was so good, or I tried this great restaurant, you know, um, that's really good. Hey, let's meet for lunch at this vegan place. It's really delicious, you should try it. That is radically different than saying, you horrible person, I can't believe you ate that burger, you know? And, um, you know, I'll give you an example. Like we actually, um, my son tried Beyond, um, Beyond Meat Burgers and he loved them. And so like he was with his grandparents and he's like, oh, we got to find a place that has Beyond Meat Burgers. They're so delicious. You have to try them. So that was a radically different approach than saying, I can't believe you horrible person. How could you be doing this? Um, and it's one, yeah, more likely to be contagious, as Tristan just said. Um, but we have to recognize there's no, it really is about getting people engaged and activated to, to change the system than it is to sort of have this rule of green 10 commandments to change their personal lifestyle. Personal lifestyle choices are not enough. Even if all of us did everything we could personally, that would only be about 30% of the problem. We have to change the system so that, and this is really important, the easiest, cheapest things for anybody to do are the best things. That's what we have to do. Awesome. Uh, we have a question. We have a number of our fellows are from developing countries. 10% uh, are from India. And we have a question here that what is the best case uh, for low emitting countries that rely on fossil fuels to transition to a green economy, even as rich nations are moving slowly? Do you have any ways to communicate with folks there or ideas? Um, I do. And, and actually, in India, there are more green jobs in India than any other country in the world. And I know India has a lot of coal, but there are many efforts, including one that we're doing at the Nature Conservancy. We are partnering with Microsoft to use satellite data to map new solar installations in India and try to make sure that they're occurring on land that is not more valuable for agriculture or nature. Because there's a lot of land that we could be using for solar and wind that is not prime biodiversity or prime agricultural land. And we want to make sure that that, that rapid expansion is guided in a way that provides sustainable livelihoods for people. Um, so really, uh, when, I, when I was um, at the climate meeting in Egypt, I was so encouraged by the number of African solar providers and companies and people and experts who were there. Solar energy is the cheapest form of energy on the planet right now in many places. And it does not require um, buying fossil fuels, enriching organizations and people who already have lots of money. And the air pollution from burning coal is just, you know, you're, you're paying for it immediately, not even long term with climate change, the horrible impact on people's livelihoods and health, typically in lower income um, areas where they can't afford to live somewhere else. And so really help, like, is there a community organization? Can you get involved in, can you use your voice to help boost it locally? You know, what's the barriers in your area to moving forward to clean energy? Do you need to find investors to help do it? Is there like public will that needs to be built? What is it? Because it is the best long-term solution for low-income countries, as well as for higher-income countries um, because of air pollution and because of long-term costs as well as climate change. Like just leave climate change to the side, find the benefits today. And Catherine, we're, we're almost mm -hmm. up against the hour. Do you have time for one more question or should we call it one, one more quick question, let's do it. Go for it. Greg. Okay, great. We have a number of questions about social media and about children. And so the question is, um, what type of stories would you recommend that people share on social media to build trust uh, with others who may or may not agree? And then, any suggestions on how we communicate climate change to children to get them to see through all the media noise and social media noise out there? Absolutely. So if you check out sciencemoms.com, I just put the link in the chat. That's the organization that I and a bunch of other moms help um, on how to talk to our kids. And when we talk to our kids, 
they get that it's bad, but we need to tell them how kids can make a difference. And so I have a global weirding episode on, I'm just a kid, what can I do? It is the most hopeful thing you've ever seen because kids are amazing. They are doing all kinds of incredible things at every level. And when we show our kids that there are ways that kids can get involved, that empowers our kids and gives them hope. And that is so important. Um, in terms of social media, social media is not, and this may shock you, a place to argue with people and change their minds. It won't. You won't argue with them and change their minds. If you want to argue with them, go ahead, but it's not going to change their minds. And I actually have a Twitter thread that explains this. So I'm going to drop this in the chat, the Twitter thread that explains why arguing with people is not going to change their minds. And that's why I just typically block. Um, but on social media, it's a great place to connect with like-minded people. So if you're a gardener, connect with other gardeners and share information on how gardening can be a climate solution, as well as on how climate change is affecting gardens. If you are somebody, if you're a parent, if you're a birder, if you're a member of the Rotary Club, if you like whoever you are, social media is a great place to connect with people that you have something in common with. And remember heart and hands, share why it matters to those people that you have that in common with and share really positive constructive solutions. And I've noticed on social media, that when I share positive constructive solutions, that they get the most likes and the most shares. People want that hope. And it doesn't lull them into complacency, it actually activates them. So I'm gonna leave you with one last resource because we're at time. And my last resource is on my website, which is just there in the chat, katherinehayhoe.com. Um, on my website, you can sign up for my newsletter. My newsletter is totally free. Don't pass those emails along to anybody at all. I'm not even Greg, he doesn't even get them. Um, and it's just to give you every week, three pieces of news. One piece of good news, one piece of not so good news, and one thing that we as individuals can do to make a difference. So every week we put those out and those are the talking points for your week. Did you know, share the good news. I heard and I'm worried, share the not so good news, making sure it connects directly to you. And then we can do this. I tried it, have you tried it? Maybe we could try it together. That's the tools we need to knock over the first domino. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I have been excited about this talk since we first uh, started communicating about it. And I must say it exceeded all of my expectations, which were extremely high. So thank you, thank you. And thank you all for joining us here today. Thanks for staying a little bit long. We appreciate it and uh, take care. I think we'll end on that note. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.